Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Anna Kurian and I teach at the University of Hyderabad in the Department of English. Today we will be doing a unit on John Donne, paying particular attention to the poem The Sun Rising. This is in the English literature pro paper on literature from 1590 to 1798. John Donne is amongst the metaphysicals. So in this unit we shall be studying about the life of John Donne who exactly are the metaphysicals and what is their significance and then finally we shall be doing a detailed explication of the poem The Sun Rising, paying attention to its themes and major tropes. Let us begin with the idea of who is John Donne. John Donne was, is one of the most prominent poets of the time. He worked and lived from 1572 to 1631. John Donne was a Catholic in an age when Catholicism was a problem. If we keep in mind the background to the Elizabethan and the Jacobian age, what we will remember is that because of Henry VIII's doings, Protestantism had come to England and Catholicism had been outlawed. Now, John Donne was born in a Catholic family in a nation that was not favorable to the Catholics. As a result, he could not get a degree from either Oxford or Cambridge because to do so would have required him to give up Catholicism and instead convert to Protestantism. However, in 1593, he did convert to Protestantism and then he was secretary to a person at court. Later, of course, he falls into disfavor because he elopes with the great person's niece. This, this is Sir Thomas Egerton, the Lord Keeper of the Great Seal and he eloped with the niece and therefore then of course he got into trouble. Later on he became a church dignitary. This is particularly interesting because from being a Catholic he moves to being a Protestant and finally he ends up as the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. He was a renowned preacher and finally he died of stomach cancer in 1631. When we think of John Donne, we also think of the fact that his poetry revolves primarily around three issues. The issue of religion, because he has an entire set collection of verse entitled the Holy Sonnets. Love and erotic love especially, and these were his songs and sonnets. And of course, through both these sets of verses, he treated of tropes and images of travel, exploration and colonialism. Now, John Donne belongs to a group of poets who are usually called the metaphysical poets. Amongst them were others such as Marvel and George Herbert. And the metaphysical poets were supposed to be poets of wit. Now wit at this point in time meant not just the kind of wit that we talk about when we talk about humor, but also the idea that you could see comparisons between dissimilar things. And wit was the ability to see the similarities between the dissimilar. In the 17th century, this is what wit signified, radically different things which you could then identify similarities between. Dunn's poetry is particularly exemplary in doing so, as is the poetry of others such as both Marvel as well as Herbert. And this we see also because he merges the religious and the erotic in both his religious as well as his erotic poetry. So in Sonnet 14, Holy Sonnet 14, what you have is the merging of the religious and the erotic because he has asked God then to ravish him and claims that he is betrothed to God's enemy, which can either be the world or Satan himself. We also see the reversal of this because he asks for his love stories to be canonized in, the poems, in poems such as the canonization. We also recognize metaphysical poetry but by something that was called a conceit. A conceit was once again an image which drew together two radically opposed things and then gave us the similarities between them. And this is particularly interesting because those similarities are then seen to be not far-fetched, not remote, but actually immediate and pressing. The metaphysical poets were, some, were the poets who fell into disfavor during the time of Samuel Johnson and the later 17th and 18th centuries and yet they come back in a big way during the 20th century. And these poets were criticized for lack of feeling. They were said to have intellectualized everything. And John Donne was of course a primary culprit of this. Disparaging commentary by people such as Dryden as well as Johnson 
said that this was pretentious poetry. These were poets who were interested in showing off how intellectual they were, how learned they were, that they were not really interested in showing off actual feeling. And so they were criticized. And yet they suffer through this lack of reputation till the 20th century, when suddenly they become once again hugely popular with eminent critics such as Grierson, as well as, of course, T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot, through his important, influential essay, Metaphysical Poets, reinstates them in public opinion. There are, of course, limitations to the idea of the metaphysical poets itself, and it is always better not to take on too much. These poems are not more metaphysical, as in more philosophical, than other poems of the age. So whether they are more philosophical or not is something that should be left open to debate. All the so-called metaphysical poets do not display the characteristics in similar fashion. So you have somebody like Herbert who writes very immediate and pressing faith-filled poetry in comparison to say somebody like Dunn who is busy demonstrating the fact that he is intellectual in addition to of course being emotional. So another way of thinking about these poets might be to see them as belonging to a Baroque tradition rather than to the metaphysical tradition. Dunn wrote a lot of poetry in his time, but interestingly there was only one volume of poems that was published during his lifetime and this was the anniversaries. In addition to this he wrote satires which was meant to be both satirical as well as funny. He wrote elegies, which are interestingly enough not elegies about people who had died, but are poems of love. He wrote songs and sonnets, which were again love poetry, and he wrote the holy sonnets. Uh, the holy sonnets were a set of poems devoted to the ideas of what religion had done or not done for John Donne. And it is important because in them he raves, he rants against God, but he also returns to a position of faith in what God has done and is doing in his life. In many ways, these can be seen as the precursor to Hopkins's poetry in the late Victorian period about God and religion once again, a tradition which is very strong in English literature. Having done this brief overview regarding John Donne and the metaphysicals, let us move on then to The Sun Rising, which is a poem of John Donne which we shall be studying today in some detail. The poem The Sun Rising is in a direct tradition which begins with, shall we say, Ovid's poem, O Aurora. It's something which is called an Obad, which is a poem which is about the coming of dawn and how it breaks up the time which has been given to the lovers during the night. So the Obad was a greeting of the dawn, but it is also a greeting of the dawn which then is mournful because the dawn is the time when they will have to part from each other. So the speaker then chides the sun for disturbing the lovers by dawning at that point in time. If you look at the poem, he begins in an extremely conversational tone where he starts by saying that busy old fool, unruly sun, why dost thou thus through windows and through curtains call on us? Must to thy motions lover's seasons run. And this is a fascinating opening because as we can see, he is directly addressing the sun. But he does not address the sun with reverence or with honor or with respect. Instead, he calls him a busy old fool. So the sun then is seen as somebody who is both old as well as a busybody, somebody who is interfering in what is of no concern of to him. And thus when we see John Donne begin the poem, he begins then by scolding the sun for doing this. And what he is also setting up is a parallel between the small world of the lovers which is encased in the bedroom and the larger world of material concerns and business etc which is out there which is actually where the sun should be rather than here within the bedroom of the lovers. And then as he goes on he claims that the sun is somebody who should be talking to courtiers, to schoolboys and to other people who have a life outside and that he should leave lovers undisturbed here in their bedroom. So when he starts out with this conversational tone addressing the son as an old fool, he also then of course calls him unruly and unruly means difficult to control and discipline. So even as the son is being called old and busy, he's also being said to be somebody who does not keep to the rules which is interesting once again because it is the sun's coming and the sun's going that makes night and day the rules of life itself. 
And then when he says, must to thy motions, lover's seasons run, it is ironic as everybody's season runs according to the sun. The sun determines our life to a great, very great extent. And so when John Donne speaks to the sun and says that you have no control over us, it's like a child speaking to his parent and saying, I will not obey you. There is really no choice. And yet he says this. Finally, he goes on to say, go chide late schoolboys and sour apprentices. Go tell court huntsmen that the king will write, call country ants to harvest offices. Right? And then he says, leave us alone here in our bedroom. Which is again to claim that their world, the world of the lovers is cut off from the external world. An external world in which there are courts, there are kings, there are huntsmen, there are students, etc. That is the world in which the sun can play an active part. Whereas here he says, the sun has no part to pay, play because he is just a cranky old man who is disturbing lovers. Thus in stanza 1 itself we have a statement of the central theme of the poem which is the tussle between the materialistic world which is governed by time and is concerned about money and position and activity and the private world which is concerned with mutual love and which is outside of material concerns. The sun being the harbinger of time is crucial to the everyday public world but it is not a part of the private world. The first stanza then lays out the conflict for us between the public materialistic world and the private non-materialistic world of love and romance. As we move into stanza 2, we are told that once again, as he addresses and continues to address the sun, he says, Thy beams so reverend and strong, why shouldst thou think? I could eclipse and cloud them with a wink, but that I would not lose her sight so long. Once again, he undermines the position of the sun. The sun, who is seen as being strong, who is seen as being controlling, is now being told that in just one moment, if I shut my eyes, I can shut you out. That your strength cannot then change me. And when he asks this, that when he says, why do you think that your rays are so powerful? He says, I can shut out your rays. The only reason that I do not shut out your rays is because if I were to shut my eyes, I would also shut my eyes to my loved one and that I do not want to do. So the fact that then he compares the sun's strength to the beauty of his beloved and claims that the beauty of the beloved matters more to him than the sun does makes one more claim about the power of love as against the power of nature, the power of the sun, etc. We see this again when he also claims that this is, he compares his lover to the Indias of spice and mind. A reference of course to the travels and the explorations that were taking place during this period because what we are being told is then that even the, both the Indias, the East as well as the West Indias, the East, Indi the East Indies which are to do with spices, countries such as India and the West Indies which were to do with minerals, that both of these are there present in his beloved. His beloved is far more strong and is far more powerful and is far more rich and what he has with her is then comparable to the Indias of spice and mind. He was also of course developing two of those metaphysical conceits that the metaphysical poets were famous for. One, the fact that he can shut out the sun with a wink and two, that his lover will blind the sun's eyes. Which is the second one particularly is interesting because when he claims that the lover's beauty is such that the sun will be blinded by her beauty, he is then turning it inside out. The sun is what usually blinds people. Instead, he says his lover is such that she can blind the sun itself. So what we see here in Tanza 2 of the sun rising is that John Dunn is bringing in a lot of images to demonstrate how powerful his lover is in her beauty and how powerful their love itself is. That it is such that it can claim, lay claim to being equal to tra voyages of travel and discovery, voyages with, which bring about discoveries and claims of territory which include the East as well as the West Indies. He goes on of course to then claim that further on he says, if her eyes have not blinded thine, look and tomorrow late tell me whether both the Indias of spice and mine be where they lost them or lie here with me. And then he says, all the kings of all the countries are here in one bed. He claims for himself sovereignty because he enjoys the company of his beloved. And that sovereignty is something that extends to all the kingdoms of the earth. What Dunn does 
in this poem is also then use the entire world. He, in the first stanza, he shows us a whole new world out there, a world which is outside the bedroom of the lover and the beloved. In the second stanza, he brings that entire world and locates it within the bedroom itself. So when he says that all the kings whom thou sawest yesterday, therefore then along with the kings, you would also have seen the kingdoms. Those kings and those kingdoms lie here in one bed with him and his beloved. So the large world outside has then been collapsed into the world of the bedroom here in Dunn's lover's room itself. He then follows it up and says that the Indias of spies and mine and the, the discoveries of the late 16th and early 17th centuries which were Dunn's lifetime, they were a period of intensive maritime travel and exploration for the British. Their interest in foreign cultures, foreign civilizations was also of course an interest in the wealth and the riches of those cultures and civilizations. He then locates all that wealth and all that riches, all those riches in his bedroom. So his beloved is not just a source of power but also a source of wealth and a source of riches to him. And this is an example which also is of course seen in something like Marvel's Koi Mistress where he talks about the Indian Ganges. India as a source of spice, of riches, of wealth and over here India as a source of again spices and the West Indies as a source of gold which is why the reference to the mines over here. So all in all what Dunn does is write a poem in which he is talking about his beloved. Yes, he is talking about their bedroom, he is talking about the fact that the sun has come in and has woken them both up but he is also referencing the fact that because of his lover, his beloved, therefore then their bedroom is as rich and powerful a place wherein there are kings and kingdoms just like the kings and kingdoms which are being discovered now during the period of his life in the world outside. Finally of course he moves to his last stanza which begins with she is all states and all princes I, nothing else is, princes do but play us, compared to this all owners mimic, all wealth alchemy. It's a, pro it's a statement of course which feminists have had several problems with because she is all states, all princess, I. Wherein he says then that his beloved might be a kingdom but he is the king, king which rules that kingdom. She is all states, all princess, I. It carries on from the previous stanza wherein he talked about the fact that all kingdoms and all kings are here in this bedroom. Now he gives those kingdoms and those kings a specific location. She is all the kingdoms and he is all the kings, all princess I, nothing else is and when he says that nothing else is, he is reducing the world of course to this bedroom but in addition to that when he has made the previous claim that she is all states and he is all princess, he is also of course claiming the position of power and authority and patriarchy within the relationship itself. She might be all kingdoms but he is all princess. And when he says, princes do but play us, that everything else is only an imitation. It is only a game that is being played outside. What is real is here in this bedroom. So traditionally the poem has been read as giving a very powerful claim about the power of love as opposed to the power of politics, the power of kingdom, the power of riches, etc. But now the way the feminists read it is to say that even as he then sets up romantic love against political power, he is also of course claiming a patriarchal power over the woman in the relationship by saying that she is all states and all princess I. He of course also says that all wealth is alchemy, that there is no real wealth. All real wealth is only the wealth of romantic love which is here in this bedroom. So then when he says that his lover embodies all the countries in the world and that he constitutes all the princes, there is a rather difficult merging also of the rhetoric of love right, with the rhetoric of political domination. And that problem of political dominance is something that the feminists picked upon because they said that the political dominance is also a patriarchal dominance within the relationship itself. And finally, of course, he ends the poem by saying that Thou, son, art half as happy as we, in that the world's contracted thus. Thine age asks ease, and since thy duties be to warm the world, that's done in warming us. He concludes by saying that the sun does not need to go and shine in other places. If we remember, the poem began by saying, why do you come here and shine on us? In the end, he says, shine here to thus, 
and thou art everywhere. This bed thy center is, these walls thy sphere. So you have a movement from the beginning wherein he says, don't come in here disturbing us, the lovers, to the end where he says, all you have to do is shine here in this room because in this room is the entire world. The world is then contracted and located within the room in which the lovers are. It's an interesting poem because he also then has shrunk the entire universe to just one bedroom. All power, all political states, all kingdoms have then been centered here in this one bedroom. And within this bedroom, if the sun shines, it is equal to him shine, the sun shining in the entire world itself. In the final stanza, he once again, of course, also reverts to what he began with when he addressed the sun as busy old fool unruly son. It ends also with that because in the end he says, thine age ask ease and since thy duties be to warm the world, that's done in warming us. He's reverting to the idea that the sun is old and as an old person, he doesn't really want to go around working all over the world and instead therefore then he should only shine upon the lovers. So the poem projects the sun as someone who is old and weak rather than as the source of all energy in the universe. If we were to then work with the main ideas of the poem, what we would see is that initially the speaker begins by saying that there are two worlds. There is the world of the lovers and then there is the external world. The external world is of course the world where there are school boys who are bored and who don't want to go to school. There are huntsmen who have to attend upon the king. There are apprentices who have to go out to work. It's a world of the everyday. People have to do their jobs, they have to go to school, they have to live their lives. And then there is the lover's world. A lover's world wherein there are only the two lovers who are in bed together and who do not wish to have any interruption coming upon them. He begins with this. He goes on then to magnify what this lover's world is like because then he compares the woman in the relationship to all kingdoms, all states. He also claims that she is akin to the Indias of spice and mine and that he is of course all princess. Having then set up this kind of opposition between what is outside and what is inside, in the last stanza he finishes by saying that in the lover's world the entire world is contained. That actually the sun does not need to go and shine upon other kingdoms, other worlds. All the sun has to do is shine here within the room itself. And in doing so, he will have done his duty because the whole world is here in this room. The poem then displays a tension between thought and feeling. It shows us how what he feels, all the emotions that he feels is then translated and spoken of in terms of geography, exploration, kingdom, powers, etc. And we are told about how these two come together. In addition, we are also then asked to think about what exactly is the sun like? The sun who is traditionally imaged as something which is powerful, as the source of all energy and of all heat, is here reduced to somebody who is old and who has little or no interest in doing his work. In fact, by the end of the poem, what the poet says is that you, because you want ease in your old age, would be happier if you were to just shine here into this room rather than to shine into a world outside. So, in addition to, of course, glorifying his own lover and the love that they share, the poet is also then demonstrating to us that the world outside is one worthless, but the sun itself also, which is the source of all energy, is something which is old and outdated and which requires ease rather than which requires to do its work. So, Dun, John Dunn here then in this poem is giving us a rather interesting love poem because what we are told is also a love which is more important than everything that exists outside. So all love is located here in this room. All power is located here in this room. All politics is here in this room. So finally, wealth, politi political power and other kinds of power, everything is then located in just one small room wherein the two lovers are. But it also combines two of Dunn's favorite themes, erotic love and travel, exploration and colonialism. And the idea of colonialism and post-colonial readings of this poem is important because when he says that all kingdoms lie in this room, he is also then making a case wherein Eng England or the lover's room is the location of all power. All other kingdoms will come here and offer tribute. The rest of the world is irrelevant. 
all that matters is this english room and this english location wherein there are two lovers so what we see is done creating a new world order if you will by the poem the sun rising and in this new world order there are several things that contribute one is of course the fact that the sun itself is old it is a fading sun it is a sun that is unruly and old and which wants ease which wants a lazy life there is also of course the fact that initially we are given two opposed worlds which are then combined conflated and brought into one small bedroom and therefore then all the other worlds as well the worlds of india east and west indies the worlds of riches and wealth all of them are also brought here and that's a post colonial move which is being made a move which then endorses a certain colonial idea that you can take everything from the east and the west indies and bring it into england and finally of course he brings the fact that you don't really need to go out into the world here is the entire world and by saying so we are once again doing a slightly post colonial reading because we are claiming that the world is england there is no other world all of the kings all of the princesses have been taken away instead there is only england and the world of the lovers so even as the poem glorifies and eulogizes romantic love it also eulogizes a certain sense of the world wherein the rest of the world is irrelevant there is only the world of the english lovers which is important and finally by claiming that the sun itself is old and faded he then gives himself more importance that love is more important than the sun as the source of all energy feminists as well as the post colonials have taken umbrage against this poem have disputed the idea of romantic love within the poem because they say that this is the kind of romantic love which privileges the man rather than gives equal importance to the woman in fact we do not see the woman speaking at all it is only the lover who speaks the beloved keeps quiet the beloved is only a sidekick who's there in the room but we are not really given any understanding of what she thinks or feels the second part to this is to think in terms of how would somebody from a colonized nation read this poem because then what you see is that everything all the other countries which later become english colonies are being taken into this poem and contained within the bedroom of the poet so both post colonial critics as well as feminists have had disputations with the usual traditional reading of the poem as an exaltation of uh, romantic love we have now come to the end of this module on john dun sun rising as well as a brief introduction to the metaphysical poets we have covered the main features of metaphysical poetry we have considered the criticism of metaphysical poetry in brief and we have done a detailed explication of the poem the sun rising we have also looked at the fact that even as it is about romantic love it is also a poem with which feminists as well as post colonial critics have had some problems further reading for this would be to look at essays such as love's wealth in the sun rising or to look at a book which is on the po- poetry of john dun itself by jones called john dun songs and sonnets the poetic value of argument You could also look at John Donne's pages at Luminarium where you would get a lot of extra reading. So this is luminarium.org where you would get a lot of extra reading as well as in extra insights into the poetry of John Donne. There are also YouTube links which you could watch and these you can find in the e-text of this lesson which has been made available to you. I hope that you have gained some understanding of the poetry of John Donne. Thank you very much.